Hi, everyone. Thank you uh, very much for coming. Um, my name is Peter Sinkowskis, and I'm going to be talking to you about how Caffeine built a, a little service uh, utilizing a, a few Amazon technologies uh, to do some image processing. Um, before I get started, though, uh, the theme of this uh, event is all around building community. Um, so we have right here in the Bay Area um, the Advanced AWS Meetup. Um, I've been running this meetup for probably about four years now. Um, you can go to meetup.com slash advanced AWS, sign up and join us. Um, and one of the things that uh, is really important to making a great meetup is having speakers, uh, sponsors to pay for uh, the food and drink, um, and venues. Um, so if any of your companies uh, are interested in uh, sponsoring or they have a venue, particularly like in the peninsula, um, please come and talk to me uh, after the event. I'd love to learn more. So I wanted to tell you uh, a little bit about Caffeine and basically set the stage for what it is that uh, we're working on. So Caffeine is a new uh, way to share live events, um, both create and to view them uh, with your friends. And it's different from traditional sort of live streaming services in three uh, key ways. The first is that uh, everything that is happening on Caffeine is real time. So what I mean by that is, whenever the broadcaster does something on their show to when their entire audience sees that is about 200 milliseconds. Now while that's nice from like a, a technology bragging perspective, the real reason that we did that is to close the feedback loop between the broadcaster and their audience. If the broadcaster can connect with their audience and the audience can connect with the broadcaster, they are able to put in a very compelling show. The second thing is that uh, everything on Caffeine is personalized. So what I mean by that is when I log into Caffeine and then when you log into Caffeine, we're going to see different content because we have uh, different interests and we follow different people. Um, so it's tailoring the content specifically uh, to your needs. The second thing uh, is that uh, once you go into a broadcast and start watching a broadcast, um, it's replicating what happens in real life, um, whereas you're only seeing the messages uh, that are the most relevant to you. Typical live streaming service or like, you know, commenting systems, you just see the wall and like everyone has the same volume voice. Um, and then you, the, the pressure is on you then to like filter out the, the noise uh, within that event. Um, we're doing all of that for you. And then the third thing is, uh, in order to put anything onto Caffeine, um, you need to use our broadcasting software uh, that is going through our custom-built CDN, uh, hitting our back-end services, and it's our viewing experience through the website or the iOS application. And with that level of control, uh, what we've been able to do is sort of take this Apple approach and make the entire experience very, very simple. If you want to start broadcasting uh, uh, something on Caffeine, there's no, like, what URL do I put in? What's my stream key? What's my bit rate? What codec do I set? All of that it goes away. So as you can see from the uh, uh, screenshot on the right, um, we have a lot of images. Even this is a live streaming service. Like, we still have images. Um, and they're sort of all over the place. Um, we have uh, your avatar uh, images in different sizes, depending on, like, the, the three different locations that you can see that. Um, if this is a game that you're broadcasting, we detect what type of game it is that you're broadcasting and have the game image icon overlaid there. And then there is the preview screen for uh, what it is that you're broadcasting. So there's a few different images all in different sizes. The same thing applies uh, on iOS. Um, we've got uh, the avatar icons, the game uh, image, and then um, uh, the game logos uh, to, to put on, on top of that. So, what we wanted to do is create a service that would uh, allow us to very easily get different images in different sizes. Um, and we started with a few uh, goals. So the first one was that we wanted this to be very, very reliable. Um, we needed this to be able to scale to 100,000 uh, requests per second so that as we're growing, this service is in maintenance mode. We don't need to be like actively maintaining this. Um, we've got other challenges. Um, and then we wanted to uh, have a very fast time to recovery because part of our culture is uh, very strong on the learning process. So if you want to be very quick at learning, you need to be able to like, make changes very quickly um, and be able to get back to a known good state uh, should something go wrong. We also wanted this to be uh, 
very, very simple. Simple is like another like pure cultural thing that we have where um, we want the code to be easy to understand, we want the API to be easy, uh, easy to understand, um, and we also want this to be uh, testable, part of this like learning culture. Um, and because we are a startup, we wanted this to be cheap. And at the end of the day, what we came up with is a, a project called Snappy. And what you would do is you would say, uh, snappy.caffeine.tv, uh, the type of image that you're trying to uh, uh, fetch, um, and basically that, that location sitting in S3, and then a, a few query parameters uh, on the end there. And basically what that would do is it would take this big image that got uploaded um, and then convert that to whatever was uh, necessary. And then all of the clients uh, could work at like their own pace and they didn't have to go to backend uh, to say, I, I need this image like in this other size, can you reprocess that for me? The clients had full control over like what type of images that they needed. And when we uh, were starting out with this, we saw a, a path to utilizing a, a few technologies that we'd used a couple of times um, and wanted to get uh, uh, a, a little bit more experience with. So we had uh, some experience with Python, and at the point where we were writing this, uh, Python 3 was like mature enough that like most people were sort of like thinking about going to this. So we bit the bullet and like you know we're doing this in Python 3. Um, for the image processing, we wanted to use Image Magic because it's sort of like the gold standard, um, even though it is uh, perhaps a little more complicated uh, than some people would like. Um, we wanted to use Image Magic to do the processing, and then. Gluing all of this together, um, we're using the serverless framework. Um, and I'll go over why uh, a little bit later on. And then in terms of the AWS uh, technologies that we wanted to be using, um, there is uh, CloudFront, API Gateway, Lambda, and S3. Um, and if you sort of like think about a, you know, a, a tutorial, like an example of like what to go and build with Lambda, this image processing is one of them. It's a little different though. So why did we want to use serverless uh, for this? Because of the high concurrency uh, constraints that we wanted to impose here, as well as the fact that we're handling like user-generated content, um, we wanted a way to be able to isolate failures. Um, with user-generated content, it is in fact possible to upload an image that hangs uh, image magic. Uh, you wanna be able to sort of like detect that and not uh, have that like take down your uh, entire service. And with Lambda, like each invocation is happening separately, uh, and any one of those can have issues and not affect any of the others. Uh, the serverless framework in particular makes the development lifecycle like really, really buttery smooth. Uh, and what I mean by that is you can do your, your full deployment, um, and it will do all of the uh, cloud formation uh, to go and like bring up your, your resources. But then when you're doing development, you can just deploy your individual Lambda function um, into your, like, sort of your dev test environment. Um, and all of that, that just takes like a couple of seconds. It packages up your code and like uploads that. So you don't have to wait for all of the cloud formation uh, template to, to go through. The other thing is that it gives you very easy access to the logs um, so that you don't need to like log into the web console, click on the latest uh, um, uh, stream and then like view the logs there. It's like single command line, you can have that running in a window. And the other good thing about serverless is that, um, particularly with the serverless framework, is you can just spin this up in another AWS region um, and it's basically trivial to do that. You change like US West uh, 2 to US West 1 and deploy. Uh, there's no, really not much more than that. So how does Snappy work? A user comes along and uh, their, their client, their browser, their iOS application comes in and uh, requests uh, an image. That goes to CloudFront and CloudFront says, that's a, that's a miss, I don't have that image. It then sends that through to API Gateway which then uh, triggers the Lambda function and the Lambda function goes off to S3 and goes and uh, downloads uh, the source image uh, from S3. Once it's got that image, uh, Lambda will then invoke uh, your uh, image magic um, to do all of the processing, depending on like, what query parameters you set. And then, this is where it, it, it's very important. It doesn't write the results back to S3. It's just done all of this image processing and it doesn't write that result back to S3. 
What it does instead is it returns that to API Gateway as a binary uh, response, and then that goes through to CloudFront and then to the, uh, the client. And what we're basically doing here is the next time these requests come in, they're hitting the edge node, and we're basically using CloudFront as our storage location. Um, this runs a couple of times with a few different uh, places around the world, depending like where the clients are, and then suddenly all of your edges have the cache of the image, and you don't have to worry about any lifecycle management policy or anything. You've got the original images in S3, um, and all the other like processing that you need to do is just handled at the caches in CloudFront. Um, this also makes it like really cheap, because uh, you don't need to go and store all of these images. There is a, uh, a little trick um, that you, you need to do, and that is that uh, you need to enable API Gateway uh, to have binary support. And the way you do that is you have uh, your response uh, from Lambda. You want to set it up so that it's using a Lambda proxy so that it is uh, sending all of the information back from that Lambda response, and you want to set what the content type is uh, for that response. And then here at the bottom, you're seeing when that content response type is uh, image slash PNG or JPEG or whatever it happens to be, it says, oh, this seems like a binary response. Let me go and send that up as a binary data. Um, so that's like a little gotcha if you haven't done this before. And re originally when API Gateway was announced, it didn't support binary uh, responses. They added that a little over a year ago now. The API that we have, um, is not something that we invented. Uh, where, what we were doing is when we were uh, developing this is we were experimenting with a, a few different providers. So ImageX is another image processing service. Um, you can go and sign up and like start using Image uh, ImageX. Uh, and then Fastly, uh, who is a different CDN, also has an image processing service. This API is kind of a blend of both of those. And what that means is from a client perspective, I can make the same calls and completely switch which image processing service I want to use on the back end. So this is not like all of their functionality, this is the subset of functionality that we needed. So we wanted to be able to uh, adjust the, the height and width uh, for the images uh, that we uh, wanted to uh, process, and then that gets combined with how to fit that image. So you can uh, resize the image uh, this way and then uh, crop that, or you can like clip off the sides. Um, there's a few different options there. Different clients also want uh, different image formats. So if uh, you're on, um, uh, say, an iOS device, a PNG is probably going to be the best experience uh, for you. If you're using Chrome, uh, WebP compresses about 30% more, so you probably want to go uh, for that format. So the clients have control over which image format it is that they're getting, um, as well as the quality for that. And again, on uh, sort of like retina displays or like high density uh, displays, you want to be able to change the, the DPR, the uh, device pixel ratio, to be able to have like really crystal clear images um, within that uh, experience. And then this last entry is like a little um, strange. It's called auto and you can set it to compress and that's the only thing you can do. Again, like we didn't come up with these APIs, this was a blend of like two other services um, and this is the one that sort of worked for that. Um, but if you wanted to compress the output of that image, uh, that would be the, the API that you use there. So if we go back to uh, the goals for the project, I think we did pretty well. Um, we're using uh, CloudFront as uh, and all of the edge locations within CloudFront uh, to go and store these images. Um, this is uh, not only cheap, but very, very reliable. Like, it, it's, I'm not going to say impossible to take down CloudFront, but there are so many like, locations around the world that that would, be, uh, that would definitely make the news if that happened. Um, in terms of like, fast time to recovery, uh, if we make a, a slip up and deploy something that we you know, didn't quite work as we expected, um, uh, serverless uh, rollback is a like, single command, and like, that brings us back to the, a good state. The API was pretty simple, it's just a HTTP GET with a few query parameters, and then um, this is a, one of the things that we focused a lot on was uh, making this uh, testable. So our Python code um, is following you know, typical best practices and has uh, this test-driven uh, framework uh, built into it 
Um, has anyone here used like Nose um, to do their, their Python testing? Yeah. So what you can do is you can have Nose, and then there's a, another plugin called Nose Watch, um, which will basically just watch for files uh, to change, so that as you hit save, it will then go and rerun all of the tests. You can have like uh, your sort of uh, red green uh, refactoring process happening. So. Just finally, I'm pretty happy to announce that we're open sourcing all of this. Um, you can go to uh, github.com uh, slash caffeine TV slash snappy um, and see this entire thing. And uh, one of the things that uh, we're really big on is uh, community and uh, community involvement. So we would love to see your feedback of uh, what works, what doesn't, um, what would you uh, want to be improved? Um, what bugs have you found in this? Uh, this API is like really cut down compared to like some other image processing services. So what would you want to add? And then feel free to like fork this and you know submit PRs, and we'll be uh, pretty responsive on that. There's one other thing that is uh, inside of this uh, that I just quickly wanted to mention, and that is a there are two uh, files in here uh, that are like the line share of the work. One of them is uh, the uh, transformation uh, file, which does all of the transformations. The other one what you'll see when you go to here is uh, this thing called Logatron. And what serverless gives you is it's pu pushing all of the logs uh, to uh, CloudWatch logs. And then you would use CloudWatch logs interface to sort of like dig through those. Um, when we were first developing this, uh, what we wanted was uh, a Slack notification to come in whenever like a warning or an error message uh, was detected. It's kind of like a poor man's like sentry or exception tracking. Um, that is built into this. Uh, I do not recommend that at high volume, but in a development environment, it's, it's pretty nice. You just get a notification every time you make a, a bug. So uh, that is all I wanted to talk about uh, today. Uh, thank you uh, very much for listening. <laughs>